Good morning. Welcome to Victory and Happy Mother's Day. We miss you so much, but we want to continue our tradition of celebrating our mothers and others. All of you are so important in all of our lives, and we want to to have some great raffle giveaways today. So we have some local businesses that we're trying to bless, and we want to start with a $50 gift certificate to Joe's Pizza in Tuscola. Our winner of the Joe's Pizza gift certificate is Susan Warfel. Congratulations, Susan. Our next $50 gift card goes to Al Rancho Grande in Villa Grove. And the winner of that is Janet Zyk. Congratulations, Janet. Our next gift card is to the Arcola or Villa Grove Monocles Pizza, and it's a $75 gift card. That goes to Lisa Carlson. Congratulations, Lisa. We have a $75 gift card to Gillis's True Value. They've got some beautiful plants that you can um, decorate your front porch with. And that goes to Peggy Skinner. Congratulations, Peggy. We have a $75 gift card to Sweet Soul from Stacy and Dana and Victory Church. Melody Helmuth will be enjoying that gift card. Um, next, we have some hair care or service um, hair services from Taylor Frick, which we can all enjoy when this quarantine is over. So the $75 Taylor Frick hair care card goes to Debbie Cox. Congratulations, Debbie. And our last giveaway is a $100 gift card to Texas Roadhouse. Monica Nieto, congratulations. Happy Mother's Day again. Mothers and others, we love you, we miss you, and we can't wait to worship together soon. Good morning and thank you for joining us. Happy Mother's Day. Before we worship this morning, we'd like to open with prayer. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for your love your mercy and your grace. We just ask, Lord God, that you would have your way in this service. In Jesus' name, amen.
did. Because he went to the cross, he not only died, but he rose again, and we received that victory. Good morning, church. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there today. And I do hope and pray that you're all doing well out there. And I thank you for joining us online. But before I get into my message today, I would like to uh, start with a word of prayer. So could we bow our hearts in prayer as we begin?
Father God, I thank you for every mom. I thank you for every mother joining us today and for the special blessing and the special gift that they are into our lives. I pray that today you would truly and richly bless them in every way. Lord, I thank you that we can come together online today. I thank you that we're still able to sing your praises and glorify your name. You, Father, and you alone are worthy of all of our praise. Lord, I thank you that you're with us, watching over us at all times. Regardless of what's going on around us, you're there. Fathers, we face all these challenges of today. Let our hearts be focused upon you. And let our faith continue to grow even stronger. Father, I pray for those joining us today that you would supply whatever need that they might have in their lives. I pray for those that need healing in their bodies. I pray for those that need peace in their minds. I pray for those that need peace in their relationships. I pray for those that need your comfort and your strength. I pray for those that are struggling financially, Lord. I pray that through all of these needs, that we would all realize that you are our Jehovah Jireh, our provider. Father, I thank you that you are a good, good father and that all things are possible with you. So, Lord, I ask that you would bless and anoint this message today, that it would bring truth into our hearts and glory to your name today and forever. In Christ Jesus' name I pray, and everyone said, Amen. Well, God bless you all as we get started this morning, and if you have your Bibles, I would like you to turn to Romans chapter 8. We're going to pick up Romans chapter 8 in verse 5, and if you weren't with us last week, we started a four-part sermon series on one of my favorite chapters of one of my favorite books in the New Testament, Romans chapter 8. Last week, I encouraged you, give you a little homework, to go ahead and start on your own reading chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8 in the book of Romans. And I hope that you're doing that, but if you're not, you can start this week. But last week we ta- uh, touched on the fact that we all have a sinful nature. We all have a sinful nature. No matter who you are, no matter how close you feel like you're with God, you still have a sinful nature. We all have this bent toward sin, and nobody had to teach us ever how to sin. It was just always there. Then we also talked about the Holy Spirit. When Christ comes into your life, you'll have these Holy Spirit promptings, we called them, telling us to avoid certain situations, telling us to do and act a certain way or not to act a certain way. And then it comes down to we have to make the choice. Which voice are you obedient to? Which voice will you follow? The voice of the Spirit or the voice of your flesh? And at first, maybe the voice of the Spirit is not all that appealing, not all that strong. It's maybe just this little, subtle, small nudge. But after a while, the more you listen to that voice of the Spirit, the more you uh, learn to hear the voice of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And you begin to trust that what He's actually telling you and prompting you to do can be trusted. And it's always for your good. So with that thought, Paul continues on from that in verse 5. I want to take a look at verse 5. He says, those who are, and then I want to stop here because he uses a very strong word, those who are dominated by the sinful nature, think about sinful things. But those who are, and this is another pretty strong word, those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit, think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your minds leads to death, but letting your spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws. It never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. But he says, but you, and that's all of you that have placed your trust in Christ, that have stepped over that line in faith. And the Bible says, even if that faith is the size of a mustard seed, you are controlled by the Holy Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living on the inside of you. I want to pick this up in verse 11, because this is where this sermon is headed today. And this is mind-blowing. When you get it in your heart and your spirit, what Paul is actually telling us as believers, he says, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead, he's basically saying that what gave Jesus the power to walk out of that grave that day was the Spirit of God. Check the next words out. He says, that same exact Spirit lives in you. Wow. How incredible, how powerful that is. He says that that same spirit that brought Christ back from the dead lives in you right now. And listen to what Paul goes on to say. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal mortal bodies 
by this same Spirit. And he says it again. This same Spirit living within you. He's really trying to drive that point home. He really wants us to know that the Spirit of the living God is living on the inside of you if you have put your trust and your faith in Christ Jesus. When I think about this, that is so powerful. Everything that we've read about from the beginning, uh, back in the book of Genesis, all the way through the Old Testament, all the way through the New Testament, the Bible says that that same Spirit that was back there through all of that time is living on the inside of every believer. Did you catch that? That's amazing. The Holy Spirit lives within you and me as we put our trust in Christ. Think about it, the same power that caused a dead man to be raised to life lives inside you and lives inside of me today as we've come to Christ. That should tell us that there's no problem, there's no struggle, there's no trial, there's no test, there's no virus, there's no nothing that is too big that it should ever defeat us because we have the same Spirit of Jesus Christ that rose Christ from the dead living on the inside of us. That ought to be a moment to shout even if you're home there today saying hallelujah to Jesus because He is able because of that Holy Spirit living on the inside of me. You know, the whole problem is we underestimate the Holy Spirit. We underestimate the power of the Holy Spirit most of the time. Oh, He's there. When you accept Christ, He moves into your life. But I think for so many of us, the power of the Holy Spirit is so untapped in our lives. It's there. It's there all the time. And all we have to do is really tap into it. You know, I've got a, finally broke down and got myself a Harley Davidson uh, motorcycle. I've been wanting one for years. But every winter, I would put my motorcycle in the garage, uh, put the dust cover over it, uh, say goodbye until next spring. And when spring came and I got anxious to get out on the bike on the first good day, I would uh, go out there, take the dust cover off, turn the key, and nothing happened. Well, I finally realized I needed to get me a, ba a battery tender. So I got me a battery tender that would put a trickle charge on that battery all winter long so that when that first day of spring came, I went out, pulled pull the dust cover off, Turn the key, and instantly, I hear and feel the power of my Harley coming back to life. But when I think about that, my whole point in saying that is I'm reminded that there have been so many times in my own spiritual life when I've gone out there and I've turned on the key and nothing happens. Nothing happens. Like when I'm trying in my relationship with God, I've turned on the key a lot of times. Nothing happens. When I'm trying to be a better husband and work on my marriage, nothing happens. When I'm trying to lean into a certain relationship or something like that, and nothing happens. And the whole truth is, all along, the Holy Spirit is right there. And I believe Paul, through the Scripture, is only trying to remind us because he knows, as people, we need a whole lot of reminding. He's telling us the Holy Spirit is right there, and all we have to do is get plugged in. All we have to do is tap into that power. So once you come to Jesus, the Holy Spirit has many roles. One is to prompt us, another is to compel us. There's another one, a role to convict us of our sins, to convince us. A big role is to seal us with our salvation. After that, he'll speak to you, he'll lead you, he'll guide you, and Paul goes as far as to say he even controls you. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear that passage, I don't exactly like that word control because it has a negative connotation in our society today. But more times than not, when you're talking about a relationship and you're saying, well, somebody's controlling me in that relationship, that's not a good thing. Nobody should really control you in a friendship. Nobody should control you in a marriage. But Paul throws this out. He says that two things are happening. You're either dominated by sin in your life or you are controlled by the Spirit. And if you're like me, you're saying, wait a minute, God, isn't there a third option because neither one of those sound all that great to me? This is where we have to stop, put on the brakes for a minute, and understand what he's talking about when he's talking about control. He's basically telling us that the Holy Spirit is living on the inside of us to do what needs to be done. Paul's already said that twice in this passage. He's saying when you accept Christ, the Holy Spirit moves into your life to lead you, to guide you, and always wants what's best for your life. And in fact, if you look at Galatians, and many of you know this scripture, uh, Paul gives us a list of nine things that the Spirit brings into our lives. They're called the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
That's where the Holy Spirit wants to lead you and I as believers each and every day of our lives and to help us realize that we can trust Him. And when you hear that, nine list, that list of nine things, I'd say we'd all agree that those are all good things for our life. Amen? When I was younger, I remembered I wanted to drive so bad. I was just this little bitty guy, and I wanted to drive so bad. And you know, if you grew up in my generation, we got by with a lot more things than we could get by with today. I mean, as kids, we could crawl up in the back window of the car, fall asleep, no big deal. But I remember I wanted to drive so bad, and uh, my dad did what many dads did back in that day. Uh, he would put me on his lap. He would let me put my hands on the steering wheel. He'd, his hands were still on the steering wheel at first, and we're driving down the road, and then he would let go, and I'm a big shot all of a sudden. I'm driving the car all by myself. I think I'm really something until I start veering off toward the ditch or I start ve veering off toward the center line. And then what do dads do? If you remember, they move their big knee up into place. And they start steering that steering wheel to guide us back into the center of our lane. Well, that's the idea of the Holy Spirit when it comes to Him controlling us. He just wants to keep us in our lane. He wants just to keep us in the right lane. He wants to keep our marriage in the right lane. He wants to keep our finances in the lane. He wants to keep our thinking in the lane. He wants to keep our words. He wants to keep our actions. When you break it all down, He wants to keep our life in the center lane. He wants to keep our life in the right lane. So with this understanding, Paul gives us the implication. And I'll say implication because he follows it up in verse 12 with the starting word, and it's therefore. And Whenever you see that word therefore in the Bible, it's always turning a corner to application. Paul is saying, I've laid down some truths for you. Here's the implication, but now here's the application. I'm giving you the implication. Now it's up to you to apply it. He says, dear brothers and sisters, and notice the affection. Dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation. I love that. You have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. That's so powerful. That is so powerful. You might say, well, what do you mean? Well, it's simply put like if you're single, you've got a girlfriend, and all of a sudden you get these tingly wingly feelings, and some of you know where I'm going with this. You have no obligation to do what your sinful nature is urging you to do. You might say, oh, no, I've got to. No, you don't. The Bible says, the Apostle Paul brings out, there is no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. And look what he says in the next verse, verse 13. For if you live by its dictates, what's going to happen? Something very serious is going to happen. It says you will die. You might say, oh, that's a little dramatic, uh, Mr. Apostle Paul. What do you mean we're going to die? Well, Paul might say, well, you know, you're not necessarily going to die physically right away, but you're going to die spiritually. And when it comes to sin, let me ask you, how many of you believe and know and have found out that sin is fun for a while? It's fun. Just raise your hand there at home. I can't see your hands. I don't know if you've got your hands up or not. But if you don't have your hands up, I'm going to guess that you're either lying or you weren't doing it right. I'll put it that way. Sin can be fun for a little while. But during that little while or at the end of that little while, it's going to mess you up big time. The King James Version even tells us that sin can be fun for a season, but it leads to destruction. The truth is, it can be fun, and it is fun for a while. But when you uh, let that sin stay too long, it actually kills you. I've seen sin kill marriages. I've seen sin kill family relationships. I've seen sin kill your relationship or your closeness, intimacy with God. I've seen sin kill a lot of situations uh, in your life. Because the bottom line is, sin kills. It'll kill your testimony. It'll, it'll kill your finances. Wherever you want to go with it, you've got sin in it. It eventually leads to death. But the good news here is this scripture I've been quoting. We have no obligation. No obligation to do what our sinful nature wants us to do. So to me, sin really has no place in our lives as followers of Christ. It shouldn't be controlling our lives, I'll put it this way. Paul's phrasing may be a little uh, strange. He uses that word obligation. And he, to me, he's actually saying that if you're not listening to the promptings of the Holy Spirit, then you're obligated to your sinful nature. 
And he uses that word obligation. When I think of that, it's like we're in debt to someone. And you know as well as I do, when you're in debt to someone, there's an obligation to pay off that debt. There's an obligation to pay the price of that debt. And when temptations come, so many people try to handle them themselves in their own strength. So many people try to, if they have a crazy sinful thought, they'll just try to push that thought away by themselves. And I think, how foolish is that? How foolish is that to do things apart from the Holy Spirit of God that has moved in on the inside of our lives, that has the strength to raise Christ from the dead living on the inside of us? How foolish is that for us not to count on that and count on our own strength? Think about that. Well, Paul says it's real foolish because it doesn't work. The truth is we all live in the flesh, every one of us. And we're going to struggle with our sinful nature until we get to heaven. That's just the way it is. But we can bring our sinful nature under the influence or under the subjection of the Holy Spirit. Paul says in Galatians 5.16, Walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. And did you notice that Paul doesn't say we won't have the desires of the flesh when we're walking in the Spirit. We'll have those desires. You just won't carry them out. So the big question is, how do we walk by the Spirit? How do we do that? You might say, well, what do you even mean? To walk by the Spirit means to live moment by moment. Listening to the voice of God, not only listening, but being obedient to the voice of God. It means that you aren't just walking with Him on Sunday when you come to church. You're to walk with Him Monday through Saturday. Monday through Saturday. You're not to uh, uh, just go out there and do your own thing uh, the rest of the week. Christian living is actually a life truly lived every day, day in and day out, in obedience to God. And here's how you do it. If you're taking notes, the first way is you have to listen to the promptings or the unctions of the Holy Spirit. I talked about this last week. But many times the Holy Spirit comes to us. He speaks to us through these promptings or st strong inclinations. And think about this. What about when you feel the Holy Spirit uh, trying to tell you to do something and you don't do it? What's that called? Well, when we tell our son Austin to uh, get off of his phone and I look around and 20 minutes later he's still on his phone, we're calling that disobedience. The same with our Heavenly Father. He speaks to our conscience. He speaks to our minds and our hearts. And when we don't do what he's asking us to do, it's called disobedience. Go a little further, it's actually called rebellion. And for the record, think about this. The Holy Spirit is under no obligation whatsoever to us to explain the whys of what he does or what he doesn't do. It's like all of us as parents. When you tell your kids to do something, a lot of times they'll say, well, why? Well, our answer, the next thing we say is because I said so, and that's it. That settles it. And it's because there are some things that we can't see. There are some things that we can't foresee that the Holy Spirit can. So it's foolish for us not to listen. It's really foolish for us not to obey. I've told this story about my grandfather many times. Many of you have heard the story. But my grandfather father loved God with all of his heart. He was a man that truly walked in the Spirit. He lived his life moment by moment, listening to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. And I'll never forget the story he told me about one day when he was in his daily devotional time with God. He spent every day with God, reading his Bible and praying. He said while he was praying... He heard the voice of uh, the Spirit speak into his heart and told him about a friend of his that was in trouble and needed his help. Even told him where his friend was. So my grandpa closes his Bible, gets up from prayer, goes out to the field where he felt God was leading him to, and lo and behold, his friend was there. His friend's tractor had turned over on him. He was trapped underneath his tractor. And my grandpa was able to pull him out, basically save his life. And all because he listened to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. You may not even believe a story like that because you're thinking God doesn't speak to hearts like that. Let me tell you, if you give him time, you give him the place, you give him the opportunity, God wants to speak into your life like that. It's not the problem with him speaking. It's the problem with us listening. Amen? We have a listening problem. The second point, the next way we walk by the Spirit is to feed your spirit. I've had so many people come to me over the years, and usually when they come to the minister, 
They've let certain areas of their life get out of control. Uh, they've tried to defeat the struggles by themselves instead of them overcoming them. The struggle has overcome them and they've failed. Let me tell you, we've all failed. We've all failed in our struggle and we're all in good company because even the Apostle Paul failed. Let me read what he says in Romans chapter 7, verse 15. He says, I don't get it. The things I want to do, I don't do. The things that I don't want to do, I end up doing. That's the Apostle Paul that wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. How many of us can relate to that? All of us can relate to that. You want to do what's right, but so many times we end up not doing what's right. You might say, well, I want to start reading my Bible every day. And maybe you get off to a roaring start, you start reading three days in a row, and then you stop. It's kind of funny that you still have time to binge watch your favorite Netflix show every night, but you don't have time to read the Word of God. Or you say, I want to develop more in my prayer life. And you determine the next morning when that alarm clock goes, on, goes off, you're going to wake up, you're going to grab your Bible, uh, and you're going to uh, start reading, you're going to start praying. That alarm clock goes off, you reach over, you grab your phone, you start, start scrolling through Facebook. Pretty soon you look at your watch and you're almost late for work and you head off to work. I think it's because we're all spiritually empty. When it comes to it, down to it, our spiritual gas tank is empty. We didn't fill it last week, we didn't fill it last month, we didn't even fill it today. And you know, if we want our cars to run, we have to put gas in our cars. If you want your house plants to stay alive, you have to water your house plants. Well, the same is true spiritually. When we don't feed our spirits, our spirits are going to grow weak. And when we don't feed our spirits, our flesh is going to grow a whole lot stronger. You may be at work one day and you say, well, I'm not really joining in. I'm just laughing at some of the comments that my coworkers are saying about so-and-so. But uh, I'm not laughing. I, I mean, I'm laughing, but I'm not gossiping. I'm not really entering in. Well, you're lying to yourself because what you're doing is you're feeding your flesh. You're feeding your flesh and that desire to sin. Guess what's going to happen? It's going to get worse. It's going to grow. Well, the good news is the same can be true with the spirit. If you feed your spirit, your spirit's going to increase. Do you realize that? Your spirit's going to grow. Your intimacy with God, your relationship with Him is going to grow to a level you've never seen before. And that power of the Holy Spirit that's living on the inside of you that's greater than that desire is going to become even greater than that desire. It's going to become so much stronger. It's like if I had an empty glass up here and it was full of air. How do I get the air out of it? The only way to get the air out of that glass is to pour something else in, right? I might fill it up with water. So the question is, how do we feed our spirit? I tell you, the best way is spend time with God. Get to know Him through His Word. Start listening to Him. And over time, as you listen to Him, the more you listen to Him, the more you're realizing He's prompting you. He's wanting to lead you. He's wanting to guide you. And the more you uh, mature in Him, the closer you get to God by listening to His voice, you're going to realize, as I said a minute ago, He's speaking all the time. He wants you to go this way. He wants you to go that. He wants you to do this. He wants you to do that. He wants you to go pray for someone, go help someone. He wants you to pray or wherever and whatever He wants you to do. When you're listening to the voice of the Spirit, guess what you're doing? You're keeping in step with the Spirit. You're keeping in step with the Holy Spirit of God. And the greatest thing of all is that when you're so close to the Spirit of God, you're not going to satisfy those uh, sinful nature cravings. You're not going to gratify those cravings because you're so full of what matters that you don't even care about the things that don't matter. You're so full of the presence of God. And when you're so full of the presence of God, let me tell you, He puts things in perspective. He puts things where they need to be and it changes everything in our lives. You might say, well, how do I do this? Look at, back at the verse I just read earlier, Romans 8, verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their mind set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their mind set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. Which one do you want working in your life today? I want my mind and my heart governed by the Spirit so that I can walk in the life and the peace that God has designed for my life. And I want that for my life. And church, I want that for your life. And I believe today, we all need to stop, take a moment to realize 
that if you don't win the battle in your mind, you're never going to win the battle in your actions. If you don't win the battle in your mind, you're never going to defeat it in your actions. The first battle in fighting temptation always starts in the mind. Always. That's why we have to have the mindset that says, I'm going to choose to follow God. I'm going to choose to obey God. I'm going to choose to make the choice not to look at that. I'm going to choose and make the choice not to give in to that. And what am I going to do? I'm going to pour some more water in the glass. I'm going to fill my life and feed my life in the Spirit. I'm going to feed my spirit. So church, I want to give you a little homework as we prepare to close. For this week, if you're a Christ follower, I want you to work on feeding your spirit this week. Give God five minutes. Five stinking minutes of your time before you reach over and grab your phone, before you turn on the TV set. Then I want you to stretch a little bit. I want you to give God 10 minutes. Pray and read some scripture. You know what you're doing by doing that? You are actually feeding your spirit. And all of a sudden, your whole world, your relationships, everything else will start to change. I'm challenging you. Give it, give it a try. But don't stop there. I want you to keep track of these Holy Spirit promptings that you feel the Holy Spirit is leading you to do. And the more time you give God, the more you're going to realize that He is speaking to you. So write it down and ask God, show me who I need to pray for. And you just watch what happens. Boom, boom, boom. These names will pop into your brain. Suddenly we're praying for people for 15 minutes and it seems like a snap of a finger. And the Lord, a lot of times when you're in that prayer time, He'll tell you, you need to steer clear of that conversation. You need to steer clear of that, uh, that group of people. You need to steer clear of going in, being in that situation or whatever it might be. But when it comes down to it, when you're keeping in step with the Spirit, when you're walking according to the Spirit. As we've read, you will not gratify your sinful desires, the sinful desires of your flesh. And here's the good news. You have no obligation to sin. You have no obligation whatsoever. You have no obligation to carry out the desires of your flesh. You have no obligation toward that addiction. You have no obligation toward that anger. You have no obligation for all those things that are trying to tear you down. Because I hope by now you realize that you have something more powerful living on the inside of you as a believer that is so much greater than that desire. You don't even have an obligation to worry because the Bible tells us that the Prince of Peace lives in our lives that brings a peace that passes our understanding. The bottom line is to this whole message, you and I as children of the Most High God have no obligation to do what our sinful nature urges us to do. Every day, our sinful nature is battling against our spiritual nature. There's a war going on and wants to defeat us. But you and I have the power of the Holy Spirit, that same Spirit that rose Christ from the dead, living and dwelling within us to give life and peace to our mortal bodies. So no matter what you're facing today, you're an overcomer because you've got the Spirit of the living God living on the inside of you. So don't be defeated today. Rise up in the strength and the power of Almighty God and the power of His Holy Spirit strength, living and dwelling in the midst of your life, wanting to move in in a greater measure. I'm just praying today that you'll open your heart wide open and say, Holy Spirit, I need you. I need you, God. I need you to move in in a bigger way. I pray that that's your desire this morning. Could you bow your hearts with me in prayer? Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit would give us hope. I pray that your Holy Spirit would give us more faith. And God, for those of us that might be stuck today, I pray today would be a day of breakthrough for them. Help us to realize, Lord God, that we're powerless on our own. But we thank you that your Holy Spirit is more powerful than the darkest sin that tries to hold us back, to try to pull us down. And I'm praying that there are some out there today that would say, yeah, I realize I'm in a battle, I'm in a war, flesh against spirit. I have the power of the Spirit living on the inside of me, and I want to believe today that my God is going to give me the victory over whatever situation I'm up against. I pray that you would realize today that you need the Holy Spirit's help, that you would want to depend upon His promptings and His power, and that you'd want to follow Him. So Father, I do pray for everyone that has that revelation in their heart this morning that we need more of your Holy Spirit working in our lives. And I thank you that there is a power that is so much greater than our own strength. And that power is your Holy Spirit. God, teach us to depend upon your Spirit. 
and to admit that we are powerless in our own ability to overcome this, that, or anything else. But Lord God, we thank you that by the power of the Holy Spirit, that when we are weak, your word tells us that your strength is made perfect. God, help us to depend upon you and help us to follow and listen to the promptings of your Holy Spirit. Draw all of our hearts closer to you. Let us be more dedicated, more obedient, more devoted to you than ever before. I give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray. And everyone said amen. God bless you all. Thank you for joining us online today. Have a wonderful and safe week. We'll see you again next week. We love you all.